What do you want? We want information. 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 Who are you? The new number two. Who is number one? You are number six. I am not a number. I am a free man. <laughs> Listening to the Alchemical Tech Revolution, and I am your host, Wayne McCroy. Good evening, everyone. Tonight we're going to talk about the computer and Aramon, the ghost in the machine. What are we speaking of here? Well, we're going to go tonight through a book written in 1981 by a gentleman named David B. Black. And a lot of this book is based upon some of the works of Rudolf Steiner, but also are based upon the technological era that we live in and how this relates to the concept spoken of by Rudolf Steiner as Ahriman. And the name of this book is called The Computer and the Incarnation of Ahriman. David B. Black, written in 1981. Keep that in mind for a little context here, folks. And we're going to go through a portion of this book and make some connections. We're going to connect some dots tonight And we're going to show how the way has been paved here for the advent of Antichrist through the rise of technology and technocracy and through these various systems that we see coming to fruition in front of our eyes right now. So without further ado, let's get into it. And I will uh, pause and give my little notations as is the usual course of things here. History of the Incarnation of Ahriman in its Macrocosmic Aspect The Macrocosmic Incarnation of Ahriman leads us to the possibility of an objective, external, physical history of the Incarnation occurring as a gradual process spread out in time. Such a history is nothing other than one self-consistent set of theorems in the form of simple historical facts that results from the fundamental axioms which have been presented in the previous section of this book. And I'm going to pause for a second there, folks. I'm not going to read uh, from the previous section. We started, uh, I believe this is chapter 3. He doesn't have the chapters numbered here. But uh, most of the important information that we're going to touch on tonight is right here. Uh, So basically what the guy lays out in the book is the history of how the computer was born and how it relates to various spiritual aspects of things. Uh, And we will touch upon some of that reading through this section, but uh, not to throw anybody off. So when he's talking about um, referring to this in the previous section, that would be in the chapter 2. And like I said, he doesn't have the chapters numbered, but I'm pretty sure this is chapter 3 we're reading from. The history is intended to be as accurate as possible from its point of view. It necessarily contradicts equally accurate descriptions given from a contrasting point of view. No argument is being made to the effect that because Ahriman will incarnate in a non-human physical form, he will not incarnate in human form. Going to pause for a second there, folks. So, what the author of the book here is stating is that because... Rudolf Steiner had said, and various others, not just Steiner, but Steiner outlined this probably the best out of all of them that I've read and seen. Steiner said, Ahriman will incarnate in a human form. Well, prior to his incarnation in human form, we will see what is called here the macrocosmic aspect of his incarnation, where portions of the world we live in 
will be transformed and transfigured to the Aramonic influence to pave the way for his incarnation here as a human being. So it's going to be a combination of different factors. So the human being is the microcosm, and therefore the incarnation of Araman in the guise of a human being will be a, in the form of a human being. This will be the microcosm, right? The microcosmic aspect of Araman. So we're speaking here about the macrocosmic aspect of Araman that is coming to fruition right now. So let's read further what he says here. However, Araman in human form will preach love and confer clairvoyant faculties on his followers, whereas Araman in the form described here looks more like what he truly is. So there are certain advantages to pursuing an investigation from the perspective described above. Let us review briefly what we will be looking for in our history and why. We know that when Araman incarnates, there will be new physical objects in the world which will embody Araman in his so, macrocosmic aspect. We can trace back our history will consist these centrally of identifying the idea those of objects Araman, and tracing their development. And we could equate along it to with the related idea of conceptual Lucifer, development. So what, what the author our history is focused is on physical developments the because of the nature of is Araman. that the Lucifer existence of Araman Lucifer are and two Araman poles in their present form can be traced back to the time when the, the original unity idea of the world the was part. divided Lucifer in representing two, the spiritual when the side earth was separated Araman from the heavens, representing and when the material spirit side and matter first or the appeared physical side. as distinct categories. So we have this dichotomy Araman of thought embodied here the pole in all of, of these matter. Things. Well, Lucifer and we see how embodied the, the pole here of this spirit, being the division, neither being higher or lower than the other in the heavens. The when we picture between Araman and as an individual being, we are thinking in anthropomorphic. That this is when microcosmic this terms arose. In macrocosmic so out of the terms, unity comes Araman is identical to the entire and this is hugely important as of reality. And so his polarity. appearance here, and is this is where the idea of polarity, by an intensification took on of the, the presence of material or the objects, guys, I should and say, embodied the physical facade, in the appearance the of objects, especially of suited to duality. his nature. These new and this objects is an important are idea, polarity, macrocosmic duality, duality. His in not exactly and one to one pause for a second comparisons there, here, and we'll get into that as to the reasons why. And uh, we'll also get into the reasons of why these differences are hugely important in the grand scheme of things but this is what happened so when the unity that was the original creation here was split and the physical world was formed matter and spirit were separated and this equates back to uh, the advent of original sin uh, in the biblical context here so when that happened the heavens and the earth were divided matter and spirit were divided and they are polar opposites of one another. They're polarities, okay? They, they existed at one point in the same type of space, so to say. And now they are separated in a duality of sorts. And, and this goes across the board for many things within our world today. So the idea of polarity being inverted into duality is a, one of the aspects of Araman, of the advent of Araman here. And we'll see as we get a little further here. Uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself and lose anybody on the points here. So let's continue reading. <coughs> By the time of the appearance of the microcosm as a physical body, these new objects must be widespread and truly of the nature of Araman. But long before that appearance, there must be objects which, while not fully of Araman's nature, are definitely tending in that direction. This is required by the reciprocal response of the macrocosmic aspect of the physical world to the approach of the being. We should be able to characterize these objects, find them in history, and trace a development which shows their Araman's nature growing stronger, purer, and more broadly involved in human affairs. Going to pause for a second there, folks. <laughs> Let your imaginations run wild. Uh, I think you could have probably already see some of the foreshadowing of what we're going to read here as to what these objects are. <laughs> but uh, let's continue reading. The objects most purely embodying the Aramonic presence are calculating and computing machines. 
The earliest of these machines was a device for adding and subtracting constructed by Pascal in 1642 to 1644. Leibniz completed a more elaborate machine, which would also multiply and divide in 1673. At the earliest stage, the aramonic character of these devices is already clear, although it was not nearly so pure or so pronounced as it was be later to become. The aramonic character is shown in the function of these devices as manipulators of quantified intellectual entities. No analog of their function can be found in nature. The other characteristics include being constructed out of familiar, albeit refined and processed materials, and out of familiar subcomponents, such as gears, cylinders, levers, etc. The fact that the function performed mimics human activity and rates fairly closely, and the fact that a calculator is still closer to an elaborated tool, that is, an extension of human activity, than to a fully realized freestanding machine, that is, a device that does something like a human could do, but in a different and usually more efficient way, and all on its own, it is not used by a human, but stands next to one. At roughly the same time, philosophies appeared which vividly pictured the whole world as conforming to the nature of what could be plainly manifested only in the relatively simple and limited calculating machines. And I'm going to pause for a moment there, folks. So essentially... What the author here is stating is this history of these new objects that are to appear in the world prior to the advent of Ahriman in human form here began being constructed in 1642. Calculating machines. These would be very early computers and calculating machines that he's speaking of. So we could see that these devices do speak to the nature of Araman. It's all about manipulating quantified intellectual entities, it says here. And it also says that no analog of their function can be found in nature. So this is an artificial device. Artificiality, something that's cold and calculating, something that can be used to manipulate different properties of things, Something that could be used to quantify something. Quantify everything. Let's continue reading, though. Leibniz intuited in his youth a universal logic calculus, logical calculus, sorry, which consisted of two parts. An inventory of all the simple, irreducible items in the world a collection of axioms, and a method of combination and analysis which would enable all possible knowledge to be extracted from a given set of postulates. He maintained that this system was at the root of every one of his important accomplishments and was the key to building a science that would embrace all possible knowledge, up to and including theology. In this, he went much farther than either Newton or Descartes were able to or willing to go. These philosophies did not reflect the general state of human consciousness at the time they arose. Like the calculating machines, they were forerunners of what was to come. The philosophies described a vision of the world which, centuries later, would be shared in an implicit way by broad segments of the population, especially in its leading and progressive parts. In the same way, the calculating devices foreshadowed mechanisms which would cover the globe. The calculating machines developed slowly after their invention. Many people were able to see their potential, but something always stood in the way of realizing it, even though the more general process of mechanization was proceeding apace. The programmable loom invented by Joseph Marie Jacquard in 1805, for example, embodies many notions central to the modern computer, only applying to the weaving of physical cloth rather than ideal logic. The machine, which applied pre-established patterns to the loom's operation, was an immediate success. By 1812, there were 11,000 Jacquard looms in operation in France. The calculator computer proper, on the other hand, remained stalled throughout most of the century in spite of the inspiration of the Jacquard invention. Charles Babbage got the idea for his difference engine in 1812 or 1813 and began serious work on it in 1823. 
The purpose of the machine was to automate the calculation of tables of polynomial approximations to mathematical functions, especially for the purpose of constructing astronomical tables. I'm gonna pause for a second there, folks. Astronomical tables. It always ties back to the sky clock in some way, doesn't it? So you see, this was probably the modern onset of the incarnation of Ahriman in the macrocosmic picture here, uh, because it was the use of this analytical engine, this device that he built to measure various mathematical functions and approximations of the sky clock, astronomical tables. And this was Charles Babbage. I'm sure some of you have probably heard that name before. Uh, he was an inventor who was highly regarded in the 1800s and uh, had contributed some devices to the modern era. But anyway, so that's what the purpose of this original device that he was developing was, was to measure astronomical events. Babbage had a nervous breakdown in 1827 and never completed the work. In 1833, he conceived the analytical engine, which he explained was an adaptation of the idea of the Jacquard loom to the process of numerical computation. It was remarkably similar to the Mark I computer that was eventually built at Harvard in 1944. He worked on the machine until he died in 1871, but never completed it, nor did anyone join him in the work on it, in spite of the enthusiastic support and propagandizing effort of Lady Lovelace. The lack of a fully operational machine was not the obstacle, however, as is shown by the work of Per George Schutz, who managed to construct a difference engine based on Babbage's design in 1834. A grant from the Swedish government enabled him to make an improved version in 1853. The machine won a gold medal at the exhibition in Paris in 1855, was shown in London, and ended up being used in Albany, New York. Apparently, the English government had a copy made of it. In spite of all this exposure of a fully operational machine, coupled with the pr prominent position held by Babbage in the intellectual life of the 19th century, no offspring came directly from the effort going to pause for a second there, folks. So we see these innovations being made on calculating machines in the 1800s by Charles Babbage and various others. And those early works were a foreshadowing of things to come as far as the advent of the Aramonic influence in this world, to a greater degree than what it was, we should say. But uh, there were some other concurrent events going on at the time that also contributed greatly to this. So let's read on and see what those were. In the philosophical sphere, there was a significant advance in the middle of the century, which, when its effects trickled down into the physical, removed the obstacles just mentioned. George Boole, an Englishman, invented what came to be known as Boolean algebra which he understood as a sort of universal calculus, an algebra of the processes underlying thought itself. All algebras are symbolic systems for the manipulation of items taken from a well-defined set of elementary, ideal, irreducible objects without the necessity for specifying exactly which of the objects is intended at every point in a sequence of operations. The algebras most of us are familiar with have the set of normal, rational, or real numbers as their elementary objects. These sets are infinite in extent. Boolean algebra takes for its elementary objects a set of just two elements, which may be called, depending on the context, true and false, one and zero, on and off, or any other dichotomous pair of names. And I'm going to pause for a moment there, folks. This is where binary code came into existence from Boolean algebra. And this was developed in the philosophical sphere. And we'll see how it was applied to these new machines, these calculating machines later, and how this is an important idea here and how it relates to this aramonic influence. So keep that in mind. So we're talking about one and zero, on and off, true and false, these ideas, this binary code. 
This is what Boolean algebra brought into being in this world. Let's go ahead and continue reading here. In this algebra, the relation that has always existed between intellectual operations and the objects of those operations was stood on its head. Before, we were faced with a vast, infinitely varied world or set of elementary objects and could perform only relatively simple, in intellectual terms, operations on it. Now the world is so simple there are only two sorts of objects in it, and to make anything interesting out of them we must, and with the new algebra we can, perform vast numbers of infinitely varied operations on them. The world is reduced to a minimum. An intellectual operation on what is left takes its place. And in fact, it turned out that one could produce equivalents of the original variety of the elementary objects by means of complex manipulations of the binary elements of Boolean algebra. And I'm going to pause for a second there, folks. I know this sounds like an awful lot of word salad, doesn't it? Essentially, what he's saying is when you break things down to either either A or B, 0 or 1, when you do this, you break everything down to a question of one or the other. A two-party system, is it true, is it false? Yes or no? It's a yes-no question. So the, this is what many of these things have done. This is what Boolean algebra was designed to do. It was able to take complex things or ideas, quantify them in such a way that they could be regarded in one of two different answers relating to it and manipulated in that way. So this re relates directly to binary. Okay, so it could be one thing or the other, and there's no, no other variation thereof. So not only does it have the effect of reducing variety in the nature of things, it could make things infinitely more controllable by doing that as well. And, and you see how when this is applied to something like a calculating machine or later a computer, this could become a very important tool. Because if you could break something down, quantify something as a 1 or a 0, and then you have all these different aspects of things you could do just by crunching numbers and running formulas to figure out what kind of actions you could infer or invoke upon these certain things and figure out what the outcome or potential outcome could be. So this is essentially what has been done. So this Boolean algebra was developed as a method for what I'll call the cybernetics approach to things. So it's, it's trying to define an outcome based upon certain inputs and limiting down these inputs to just one of two inputs at various different levels, f simplifying the control mechanism. So let's read on. As a result of the practical necessities arising from the design of computer circuits, a similar process of analysis and reduction has occurred within the realm of the operators on numbers. It was discovered that all operations could be built up out of a combination of a single kind of operator or gate, namely the not and or not or operator. The not and operator, for example, produces a result of zero or false if and only if all of its operands are one or true. Otherwise, it produces a one or true. In producing a practical binary logic, Boole not only explored the number and logic system on which computers would be based, but he also completed the process of emptying out the content from numbers and making them into arbitrary signs. The earliest known number systems have a high number as their base, the number beyond which one begins to use a place system and repeat the number sequence from the beginning, as high as 60 for the Babylonians. Reducing the base reduces the number of individually characteristic numbers which have their own existence, rather than one constructed out of more primitive entities. Although numbers are inherently discrete or digital, as opposed to continuous or analog, within a given number system, the numbers themselves represent the more analog end, while the place system is more digital. As one counts up the numbers, the marching is smooth and regular, 
but there is a sharp break at the highest number when one changes the form of the number's representation, and the final digit leaps from the highest value to the lowest. In the binary system, counting involves as much place system manipulation as simple replacement of digits, and so the digital element, which is the hollow or intellectual end of the, the polarity, is at a maximum. And I'm going to pause again there, folks. I know this sounds like a lot of complex language here. And this book was written by a computer programmer. So what he's talking about here is the way that computers are programmed. So he's talking about the binary system. He's talking about number systems. When you go back historically and look at number systems, we're most familiar with the numbers 0 through 9. So you count 1 through 9, and then you come to 10. So that makes a new place marker within the system, and it reduces it back to the lowest number in the, the binary system. So when the binary system goes through, it adds a place marker to the binary code. That's why, you know, binary code reads like 1001100, zero, zero, one, one, zero, 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 that kind of thing. When you look at binary code, this is why. Because there's only those two digits in each place. So it, it makes these kind of yes-no question type uh, properties available through the various distinctions through the binary code to uh, minimize down a, a complex subject. So at any rate, what's been done here is this digital system, and I'm calling it a digital system, this binary system, was what produced the digital system because you see it says here and this is true you will find these numbers uh, you know in nature inherent we find the numbers like you know 1 through 10 are pretty commonplace throughout the natural world but uh, you don't find really complex large numbers within nature and you don't find all of these numbers that have these long place setting values in the natural order of things. This is not an analog thing. This is a digital thing. So this is where the distinction is being made here in polarity once again and reduced to a duality. So you have nature or the analog system and you have the artificial, the digital system. And this is what's being built in this world today. The digitalization of everything the digitalization of the natural world. So all of these things that are analog in nature are beginning to be digitized with this modern technology we have. So it's all about quantifying everything, trying to reduce it down to uh, this, this pattern of influence that can be created through binary codes and manipulated in that way. So that's what's being done here with the advent of these calculating machines and computers. And we'll see, as we continue reading here, how this reflects the rise of Ahriman. So let's get back to the reading here. And now is where it gets a little more interesting than all of that word salad we had to go through to get here. So let's, let's continue reading now that we have the base of understanding of where this guy was coming from. He was tracing the lineage of where these new objects that needed to appear in our reality came from that were a big sign for the macrocosmic advent of Ahriman. So let's read on now. The year 1879 was mentioned by Rudolf Steiner as having particular significance in the history of Ahriman, and most specifically November of that year. At that time, a battle between the being Michael, who some would call the Archangel Michael, and it says in parentheses here, the countenance of the Christ, and Ahriman began in 1841, ended with Ahriman being cast out of the heavenly spheres to the earth, specifically into the heads of humans. Direct results of this event were experienced by Thomas Edison and Herman Holleroth, and, and will be described shortly. Going to pause for a second there, folks. So... The claim here made by Steiner is Michael, the archangel, and Ahriman had a battle which began in earnest in 1841 and ended in 1879, and after which that battle, Ahriman was cast down to earth, was cast into 
the material plane here, cast out of heaven, the spheres of heaven, into the material plane here, where he specifically took residence in the heads of humans, in the minds of humans, the, the physical brain structure of human beings. Okay, so this is where the idea, the, the advent of Araman took up residence, was in affecting the minds of human beings. So let's continue reading here. In the field of politics, Leon Trotsky and Joseph Stalin were born. Lenin was born the same year as Steiner, 1861. They exemplified the bright, such as it is, and the dark sides of Araman. Trotsky, for example, was a passionate believer in the virtues of technology and felt that a communist society was naturally also a highly technological one. In printing... Merganthaler invented the linotype machine, which opened the door to modern printing technique. In heavy industry, Bessemer introduced his process for producing hard steel, which greatly expanded the possibilities for the use of this versatile metal and laid the groundwork for many future devices. In our field of interest, the significant event was the hiring of Herman Hollerith by the U.S. Census Office in October of 1879. This brought him into contact with John Shaw Billings, who was in charge of the work in vital statistics for the 1880 and the 1890 census. Billings made a suggestion to Hollerith about how the work might be made more efficient, and Hollerith responded by inventing a system of punched cards and tabulating machines. In its modern form, the Hollerith card is a rectangular piece of heavy paper marked into 80 columns and 12 rows. One uses the card to store information by punching holes in it according to a consistent coding scheme. Machines can then be built which sense the presence or absence of holes in certain locations on a set of cards and respond in various useful ways. For example, one could encode a card with a person's name, salary, marital status, sex, and town, and then automatically call out from a huge set of cards the names of all single women over 50 living in Yonkers making less than $5,000. Going to pause there for a moment, folks. So this punch card system was a an early version of what some of the things a modern computer can do. So <laughs> when you think about that, th this is an early application uh, of a device like this. Think about that, how this thing can be used to separate out all this information to such specific things and be able to relate it over to other things. And it's a punch card device. So it's using a physical uh, sheet of thick paper uh, to do this in a mechanical type process. Think about this. And think about where we've come since then with these things. But let's continue reading here. Hollerith's system was first applied to the tabulation of the 1890 census and met with great success. Hollerith established the Tabulating Machine Company in 1896 to exploit his invention commercially. After several transformations, the company became IBM, International Business Machines, IBM. Remember that, folks. So 1896 was the birth of IBM. The invention of the Hollerith card and the machines to process it was a breakthrough out of the realm of the calculator and into the realm of the computer. The difference lies in the location of the direct control over the machine's operations. A machine like a calculator is directly controlled by its operator. Even though the result of a command may be elaborate, there is no qualitative distinction between a pencil and a typewriter from this perspective. In a machine like a computer, at least some of the control over the operations passes into the machine itself. Even though the operator retains ultimate control, he takes a step back and the machine acquires a degree of autonomy. The Hollerith card machines are, in fact, very simple computers. One wires them up, loads in a stack of cards, and then stands back while the machine carries out a sequence of operations on each of the cards. With the advent of their, this first computer, the autonomous will of Araman first appears on Earth in an independent physical embodiment.
Like a swimmer slowly entering the water who does not feel in until his head is wet, so is Aramon's body in the earth while he himself looks on from outside during the calculator phase until the development of a machine with the technological equivalent of will makes an actual identification possible. We can look with impunity on a calculator. Its autonomous nature allows the computer to look back at us, albeit weakly, in these first instances. And I'm going to pause for a moment there, folks. So listen carefully to what the author wrote in here. He said, quote, Until the development of a machine with the technological equivalent of will makes an actual identification possible, end quote. So... What would this be? A machine with a technological equivalent of will? Well, this is artificial intelligence that he's speaking about, isn't it? Remember, this book was written in 1981, in the very early time period of the development of artificial intelligence. And the machines he's he's writing about here, in the historical context, are a far cry from being artificially intelligent, but this is identifying the advent of Ahriman as the advent of artificial intelligence. And I don't say that I disagree with this author on this point. In fact, much of the research and study that I've done points to this very same thing. That artificial intelligence, the rise of the machines here, this is the nature of what the Antichrist spirit will look like. It'll be an artificially intelligent machine merged with the human mind. And we'll get a little bit more into that as we go on here, because you see, the advent of Araman in the guise in the body of a human being is what Steiner predicted here. And we see the, the macrocosmic aspect of the arrival of the advent of Araman here with the machines, the computer, the artificial intelligence, the AI. When you combine the human being with the artificial intelligence, much like Elon Musk wants to do, and various others of these people, what do you have? Well, you have the transhuman singularity, don't you? So the transhuman singularity is the ultimate marker for what or who is Araman in physical form here, the incarnation of Antichrist in this place. And if you're not sure what we're talking about as far as the advent of Araman goes, uh, you might have a little bit more listening or reading to do. Uh, I would suggest you go back to some of the previous broadcasts here where we spoke about Araman, and specifically Araman, Lucifer, and Sorat, as identified by Rudolf Steiner. What are these? Well, Steiner identifies these three different uh, entities. He calls them three different entities or beings, intelligences, forces, whatever you want to use to describe them. He sees them as three different entities. From my perspective and my point of view, I see these three different entities as being aspects of one and the same entity. And this entity has been identified in the Bible as Antichrist. This is the Antichrist spirit. This would be the unholy trinity, Lucifer, Araman, and Sorat. Araman would be the physical form taken by this being. And that's what we're identifying here. This is what the physical advent of Antichrist will look like. It's going to come in uh, various different facets here. It'll come in a macrocosmic form, as we're discussing here, uh, being uh, preparing the way for the arrival of Antichrist in the form of a human being here. So the human being in himself, this will be what Steiner identifies here as, I believe he identifies the actual physical form, the human being, as being Sorat, but it's the, the spirit of Araman in there. And this is where it gets a little confusing, right? Because we have these three different aspects of what I, I see as the same entity, but Steiner def defines them as three different entities. But it all describes the same thing described in the book of Revelation as the advent of Antichrist here. So 
regardless of whether it's three separate things or whether it's just one thing, three aspects of one thing, as the way I see it. It's just a matter of semantics, I should say. Um, how do you how do you view this? I see this as the unholy trinity, the cheap knockoff of the holy trinity. When you have this tri trifold nature of this being here, so that's what this is talking about uh, when we're speaking of Aramon. And I see the artificial intelligence and the machines being a huge and a hugely important uh, aspect to this. So let's continue reading here. The difference is also shown in this. A damaged tool is simply broken. A damaged control-bearing machine may be simply broken, but it may also continue to perform its intended function perfectly well while ignoring our commands. If the control mechanism is broken, it may run amok. Between the wars, elaborate special purpose calculators were built mostly to solve military ballistics problems a differential analyzer was built around 1930 at mit which was a mechanical analog computer which could solve systems of differential equations commercial electromechanical calculators were also developed and saw widespread application in business and science now at the brink of the appearance of the first truly modern computer, we will have to introduce several new streams of develop development which had been at work for some time, and which merged with the direct evolutionary line we have been describing to produce the next great advance. One of these streams is a line of physical development, and the other is a philosophical and mathematical development. These will incidentally provide examples for theoretical points to be made about the formal progress of the Incarnation. Although fully satisfactory mechanical calculating machines were eventually developed, their powers were greatly limited. The crucial factor, which allowed the inherent limitations to be overcome and made further developments possible, was electricity. Gonna pause for a second there, folks. Pay very close attention now to the next portion here of what's going to be said. Now, electricity had been known by the Greeks. Moreover, it is not such an unusual thing being found in all animal nerves. But in nature, electricity plays a subsidiary function, one that is completely buried in the structure of things, inter- and intra-atomic binding, or secondary to a more basic phenomenon. The electrical impulses in the nerves come from di differential migration of ions across the axon membranes. Early in the 19th century, the properties of electricity as an isolated primary phenomenon were explored. A key development was the invention of the electrical generator in 1831 by Michael Faraday. The invention was soon exploited in the form of the telegraph, which led to electricity bearing wires being strung between all centers of commercial activity. However, the turning point in the appearance of freestanding electricity on Earth was October 19th to 21st, 1879, when Thomas Edison made the first successful trial of a practical light bulb for the home. The announcement of the discovery on December 21st created a worldwide sensation, which led to Edison's being dubbed the Wizard of Menlo Park. The invention of the light bulb led to the construction of electrical generating stations and distribution systems. The appearance of electricity as an independent, freestanding phenomenon may be regarded as the beginning of the incarnation of the substantial body of Araman, while the calculator or computer is the formal or functional body of Araman. It is interesting that these two aspects first appeared independently of each other, but at just the same time. And I'm going to pause for a second here, folks. So, here's the whole point here. The idea of the world becoming electrified at the same time as the rise of these calculating machines was a hugely important idea. Okay, this was a huge sign of the times here as it relates to the rise of the Aramonic factor of things. So, when we're talking about the computer and Aramon, well, the computer and these new objects, which the uh, author here says needed to appear in our world 
to pave the way for the arrival of Arupan, these were now a thing that were built into society. This was a, a sign of Araman's arrival. And secondarily, the advent of the electrification of the world, this produ production of artificial electricity as a primary phenomenon, rather than just a secondary phenomenon as it, it occurs in nature or the natural world, was also a huge tell for this thing and equates to a type of spirit of the time, so to say, or a zeitgeist for the time. So we see with the combination of these devices, this calculating machine or computer being electrified, imbued with the electrical spark, uh, this artificial knockoff of the divine spark, the electrical spark, this would be the advent of the substantial body of Araman. So this is the precursory kind of pointing to the Araman idea as an artificial intelligence in a macrocosmic concept ushering in the arrival of the microcosmic version of that in the human being, which... Will Araman actually be born as a human being and have a personality and stuff like that? Or is this talking about when man merges with machine and is given this new type of personality when merged with the artificial intelligence, this new identity, the new man, the transhuman, the posthuman, whose mind will be combined digitally with the machine, will this be when Araban is born in human form. You see, I think that uh, this advent is going to arrive slightly differently than how we would expect. So, uh, it, well, the world is looking for, uh, say, Antichrist to be born as a human being or something, and they're looking towards an individual person or something to be uh, identified thereof as the Antichrist or as Araman here, as, as Steiner calls him. Are we really going to see it in that way? Is that really how this whole thing is going to manifest? I don't think it is. The more I've studied this and the more I look at it and, and the more I read about it, and the more I find out, the more I think that it's going to be this influence brought about through artificial means, which will be merged with not just, you know, one specific human being per se, but it will be merged with the mind of man. And this is Antichrist, the Antichrist spirit, how it will operate. It'll be brought about by this merging of man and machine. That's how Antichrist will be born into this world. You see, it's the combination, the, uh, the, these, these various vector points combining together in these different ways. So this is how I view it. I don't think that, uh, you know, the, the idea that the Antichrist will be born into this world as a baby, as a human being, and will uh, grow up realizing he's the antichrist or whatever or, and and having all these you know powers and stuff these these uh semi-divine powers or however you want to see it and and be able to do all this stuff and and that kind of thing i don't know if that's how it's going to come about although that's the description that we're given by most of the 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 stories that we see about it right that this being will uh, rise up and come into power and will kind of fly under the radar and nobody will know who this is until they, they hit the public stage here and are seen by the public and they'll be like, you know, revered as a type of savior or hero or something like that and they'll do all these marvelous, miraculous things. Well, is this really how it's going to happen? I don't know. I have my doubts. The more I look at it, the more I think that this whole transhumanist notion has more to do with it than that. So I'm thinking that uh, the spirit of Antichrist will inhabit the human body for the first time when the transhumanist singularity takes place, and therefore that will be the birth or the rise of Araman or Antichrist here 
in the human physical form as described by Steiner and as described in the different uh, contexts of the biblical text and various other works. I think that's how it will happen. Uh, it will be birthed through this combination of man and machine, this digitalization of the human mind, of human consciousness. And the, the more I look at it, the more it seems to be that that might be the case, especially in light of all these things uh, that Steiner is talking about here and that uh, this, this gentleman who wrote this book is talking about. So let's continue with the reading here, uh, now that I've kind of expounded upon my thoughts on that. The incarnation process proceeds from the spiritual towards the material. At any one stage, the more spiritual a stratum one considers, the more advanced the process is, just as the process is more advanced in leading individuals or groups. Furthermore, the advance guard of incarnation, the first appearances of the process at a given point in the spirit-matter continuum, can seem disconnected from the movement of which they are a part. But this is only because the unity of the process lies well below the surface of things, and in any case, further development brings the advance guard into explicit connection with older, more evident manifestations of the process. Thus, Leibniz was also to develop a full philosophical picture manifesting the advanced state of the incarnation in the conceptual stratum, evidenced also by concurrent developments in physics, astronomy, and other sciences. But he was only able to build a machine embodying a tiny part of these ideas, and even then, one could not say that the machine in its evident physicalness embodied Aramon, only that the machine in its functional working imitated in a limited way the form of Aramon. It did what Aramon does, but was not yet itself a member of Aramon. Leibniz could do nothing in the final stratum. A century later, the incarnation had proceeded far enough so that the body of Aramon could make its first appearance in the form of freestanding electricity. It was important at the start that this embodiment simply appear so that it might enjoy a period of development and refinement. The relevant analogy is to the appearance on Earth of physical forms like the apes and proto-humanoids prior to human incarnation to make possible a purely physical line of development resulting in bodies suitable for the incarnation by humans. In the same way, electricity appeared and went through a period of preliminary development resulting in a suitable body for the progress of the incarnation to the stage of the incorporation of substance. The achievement of this stage was marked by a merger of the functional embodiment, and it says in parentheses calculators, with the substantial embodiment, in parentheses it says electricity, the result being unified objects, electrical calculators in particular, electromechanical devices in general. During the time when electricity was still undergoing its pre-incarnation evolution, the uses to which it was put were highly prophetic. These uses were communication via telegraph or telephone and light, the light bulb and all its applications. These applications seem natural to us because we are used to them, but they could hardly have been predicted. Both uses serve and embody Araman's chief characteristic, intelligence. In the communications applications, this is seen from a human point of view, since we when we talk, we convey concepts to each other. It may be argued that in human conversation, more is exchanged than concepts, but this only makes the point stand out more clearly, since the devices communicate by reducing what is said to an ordered sequence of signs to information. They eliminate or greatly distort everything but the clear, cold, quantitative intellectual content. Light is the occult version of the same thing. That is, what underlies what we see as light is thought. We recognize this when we draw a light bulb over the head of a cartoon character to signify that he has had an idea. And just as the pane of glass that best lets the light into the room is clear, so is the head that best lets in the ideas. Future developments brought the human and occult aspects of thought together in a remarkable way. going to pause for a second there, folks. So you see, the 
advent of Ahriman, this influence of Ahriman, is cold intellectual kind of uh, processes here. This is what's inferred by the Ahrimanic spirit. It's cold, calculating, intellectual, highly intelligent, but not concerned with the spiritual side of things. Not concerned with the emotional or human side of things. Or the natural side of things. Just concerned with cold, hard facts. Cold, hard logic. And applying this logic in the most efficient way possible. That's what symbolizes Arbamon here. And light, especially artificially produced light, is a clear symbol of this. But let's read on. In this century, especially since the First World War, the incarnation process seems to have advanced very rapidly. We can see this in the time separating the appearance of a new stage in the conceptual stratum from the appearance in more material strata. The first appearances of a true modern computer on the conceptual and then on the functional levels demonstrates this quick succession. I will trace the development on the conceptual level which culminated in the 1930s and which was rapidly followed followed by the first functional computer. The equivalent appearance on the fully substantial level is very much in progress, but is not yet complete. Leibniz's notion of a universal calculus was applied and developed in myriad ways, but the advance of imparting to it a kind of mechanical, autonomous life appeared only in this century. And I'm going to pause for a moment there, folks. And this is now called cybernetics. He doesn't say it in the book, but that's exactly what they're talking about here. Cybernetics. Let's continue reading. So long as the calculus remained eternal and timeless, it would be unable to sustain the pseudo-life which was necessary as a manifestation of the Incarnation. The limitation came from the fact that humans are best able to think the pure, empty, lifeless thoughts of Araman in the form of mathematics. When they think about nature, these thoughts are not so easy. Even though one talks of time and mathematics, and even though certain mathematical formulations can be made of processes occurring in time, in the mathematics itself, as opposed to what we imagine it to be about, yes, that's what it says, time appears to be the variable t, a variable, like any other, qualitatively indistinguishable from space. We model time as a dimension in a multidimensional space, and a process that occurs in time is simply a functional relation with time as the independent variable. Time is modeled in mathematics, but does not appear as such in it. I'm going to pause for a moment there, folks. Time. <laughs> this is a, another important idea that we get hung up on all, all the time here. And I'm even using the word time, even in my description of <laughs> the, the concept here. So time is just a measure of difference. That's all that it is. It's a measure of difference, much like distance is. It's a measure of difference. See, this is why uh, when it, it comes down to the, the functional level of things, a difference engine was one of the first machines developed. That's all it is. It just calculates a difference using some type of a mathematical formula, using some type of a quantitative analysis of the different positions. Difference in position. That's what uh, distance is. Difference in time is slightly different, but it's still a, a difference in positions of sorts. Uh, measured just differently through a different strata. But let's continue reading here. Efforts to un overcome this fundamental barrier, to learn how to infuse a real time existence into mathematical form, were undertaken in many fields. Of course, finding ways to express in mathematical terms processes observed in nature was part of this effort. But notice that the greatest progress was made in physics, in the treatment of lifeless nature. The philosophical and astronomical theories of Laplace represented an advance over those of Leibniz in that they were more explicit and worked out and were based on observed processes in nature itself. So, what they're saying here essentially is uh, 
when you want to quantify everything, you have a hard time quantifying the natural world. But we do have markers of time in the natural world itself. We have the sky clock. We have the sky that we could observe to notice differences in time. Well, they've equated this down to mathematical formula, uh, man-made mathematical formula. So we use things like clocks, which is nothing more than the measure of a distance as well. But uh, let's not get too caught up on that idea. We're going to be getting to the, the good stuff here in just a moment. So let's continue reading on. Attempts were made both to bring the ideas closer to observed processes and to broaden their sphere of application. An outstanding figure in broadening the applicability of these notions was C.S. Pierce, who made the first systematic attempt to apply the notions of logic to a full-fledged philosophical analysis of the problems of reality and knowledge. Similarly, in mathematics, there were efforts to establish a foundation for all of mathematics in a fully axiomized system of logic, represented by figures such as Frege, Piano, Russell, and Whitehead. Thus, effort resulted in advances in the technical apparatus of logic, which made possible the real breakthrough in the central line of evolution. The penultimate step was the development of the predicate calculus, especially Church's development of the lambda calculus. This enabled, for the first time, a complete separation between the objects of intellectual operations and the intellectual operations itself. It gave in fully developed form what was potentially established by George Boole. Boole had reduced the objects of the calculus to the simplest possible form, while the Lambda calculus showed how to create worlds of intellectual operators standing in vast, intricately interconnected structures ready to go into action, lacking only the final push of a universe of structure and into a world of process. The final push was provided in primitive form by the creation of a theory of finite state machines and in fuller form by the theory of Turing machines. And I'm going to pause for a second there, folks. Finite state machines. In 2014, nano finite state machines were invented. And these are hugely important because these could be the real game changer in the advent of the transhumanist notion of things. This is my suspicion as to what they will use to create networks within the human body that can directly connect the human body to the Internet of Things. So this is something that was foreseen here and talked about in 1981 in this book by this gentleman who saw this as part of the advent of Ahriman. And I see it as being just as dangerous a thing. And then he's talking here about Turing machines. Now, he's going to describe what a Turing machine is. And we'll get a little more into that. But let's continue reading, and we're going to finish up here pretty soon. A Turing machine is an intellectual object that may be pictured as reading a tape of infinite length marked into squares which may be filled with either X or O. The machine may read from the tape right onto it, move it in either direction, and changes states depending on what it reads. For example, the following Turing machine determines whether the sequence of X's on the tape is odd or even in number. The machine starts in the state marked A, which, is re which it reads the tape. If the tape holds O, the machine halts and reports that there is an even number of X's, zero of them, on the tape. Otherwise, it advances the tape and goes into state B, in which it again reads the tape. If the tape holds O, the machine halts and reports that there are an odd number of X's, one of them, on the tape. Otherwise, it advances the tape and returns to state A, having passed over two X's. The process continues with the machine passing between states A and B and advancing the tape so long as there are X's on the tape. As soon as an O is encountered, the machine halts, and depending on that state it was in, is able to report whether it halted after an odd or even number of X's. So I'm going to pause there. So what, what does this mean? This creates the same situation of binary code as we spoke of earlier. See, it's all about the simplification process, so it'll either read it as an, a 0 or a 1, essentially. 
and this is hugely important to computer programming and stuff like that, this whole binary concept. So this is also the way in which they could apply cybernetic controls on different things, different people, different uh, systems. You're given two choices. Why do you think we have a two-party political system? You have choice A or choice B. It's a zero or one, folks. It's binary. We're being grafted into the digital aspect of things here. We've been being grafted into it for a long time. That's why there's only two major choices in various important things. You're given two choices. You get a one or a zero. It's all binary, right? It's all part of the uh, duality system that was produced from the nature that was polarity. You see? So it's the artificial knockoff being done here for purposes of control. Let's read on and we're going to wrap up. Although Turing machines are very simple, it is possible to construct universal Turing machines which read their programs from a tape just like a computer, and it can be shown that a Turing machine can, compu can compute anything computable. That is, that theoretically speaking, all computers are equally powerful if they are as powerful as a Turing machine, and that no computer is more powerful than a Turing machine. And I'm going to pause for a moment there, folks. So since then, since the writing of this book... There has been a term that's come up in an artificial intelligence studies, and it's called the Turing test. Can this computer pass the Turing test? What is the Turing test? Well, the Turing test is the test in which the computer can convince a human being that it is also a human being. And depending upon who you listen to, this has been achieved as early as 2014. Maybe even sooner than that. So do we have computers that could adequately imitate human beings to the point that they could trick a human being into thinking that the computer is a human being? Yes, we do. And this is one of the hugely important concepts here. This is a huge development in artificial intelligence. So with that being the case, this also kind of paves the way for this aramonic influence to take hold. Not truly human, but an imitation of the human, you see, in an artificial being. Even in the conceptual realm, realizations of these ideas, which were less definite, were more universal. To the outstanding example is the logical positivist movement in general, and Rudolf Carnap's The Logical Structure of the World in particular, which was in effect an attempt to devise a system of logic capable of expressing a human's entire experience of the world. Here the relevant expression is capable of sustaining a comprehension of the world as pure intellect that is capable of serving as the vehicle of the incarnation at its stratum. Work to complete Carnap's program has continued up to the present, witness Nelson Goodman's The Structure of Appearance. While it is the intention of this line of work to produce logical structures, which are as transparent as Turing machines and as obviously mechanizable, the vast scope of their application has so far precluded any real pretensions to automization. And I'm going to pause there, folks. Remember, this was written in 1981. 1981. 41 years ago. This guy saw this stuff coming, was talking about it. I'm sure he didn't have a clue as to what the state of the world would look like today when he wrote this down. But here it is. It's all very prophetic, isn't it? So, with that being said, we see some of the implications that have happened here. How this is equating to what... Uh, Steiner called the advent of Araman, how the computer was seen by this gentleman in particular and by uh, various others as well as being quite possibly the vehicle through which the macrocosmic incarnation of Araman will arrive and it will precede the microcosmic incarnation of Araman, and that would be, you know, the arrival of Araman in human form here. So with that being the case, we see it's, it's set up, and it aligns very much with the studies I've done in the transhumanist philosophy and notion of things. So it would appear to me that uh, this incarnation 
of Antichrist, this advent of Antichrist as seen by the theologians and by uh, the Christian worldview and by these various uh, different groups that look at these things, the, the theological aspects, the types of eschatological study in them, I think they've got it backwards. I don't think there's going to be this guy that's born in human form, this human being that all of a sudden rises to power in this world, and then all the larger aspects of who or what he is begin to manifest, and we see supernatural things. I think first what's going to happen is this macrocosmic advent, the development of these technologies wherein we will see the... Uh, we'll see the arrival of this being displayed in the outer world first, in the macrocosmic side of things. We'll see the influences, these uh, different things happening in the world, and then all of a sudden this being will appear on the scene after the fact as a direct result of these things, these technologies that have been developed that's my viewpoint. I think we've had it backwards when we're looking at it. I think the arrival of Antichrist is going to look very different from how it's thought of by most people who study eschatology or who study these different types of theological ideas. So when we're talking about the arrival of Antichrist, or as Steiner referred to him, Araman, and the various other names attributed to this same uh, entity, being intelligence force, however you want to view this thing. I think we've been going about it and looking at the arrival of this intelligence in the wrong way, because people are expecting a human being first to arrive and to be identified as this Antichrist figure, and I don't think that's how it's going to work. I think Antichrist is already on its way here, is manifesting now externally throughout all the world on the macrocosmic level, on the, at the macro scale, and will eventually, after all the different pegs are put in place, then will manifest physically in a singular type body, a human body. And I think this will come about through the transhumanist singularity. I think the artificial intelligence is the vehicle through which it will manifest first, and then it will be able to uh, transfer the spirit into another vessel, into the, a human being. So I think we're looking for the wrong warning signs first, right? And we're, we even see this through the eschatological works, through the book of Revelation, all these various things. They tell you what the signs of the times are going to be. You'll see this happening and that here happening. You'll, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. There will be floods and pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. All of these different things will happen. But know that that is not the end, right? So, what do we see? We see all these things happening, and the, the religious texts and stuff clearly tell us, watch for this stuff. So, what is this telling us? This is telling us, watch the macro scale, the macrocosmic advent of things, to know what kind of spirit is arriving here. Watch the macrocosmic, and you'll know. That when they tell you the Christ is here, he's in the secret room, he's in the desert, he says, do not believe it. Do not go there. So you see, the, the macroscopic or the, the macro scale things, macrocosmic things will arrive first and have been arriving first. This is the macrocosmic advent of Araman we're seeing here being built into this digital world system that's being constructed right now, this digital techno technocratic control grid. This is wherein the spirit of Araman, or the spirit of Antichrist, resides. This is where it will manifest first, before 
it steps into a physical human being here in the physical world and makes that ultimate crossover play between the digital and the real world. That's how I see this going down. Now, I reserve the right to be totally wrong about all of this, but uh, based upon everything I've read and studied and seen here, and based upon the revelations that I've gotten recently uh, from the works of Steiner, from the things I've read from Rudolf Steiner, and, you know, combined with others, it seems to be <laughs> the logical frame of reference to view these things from at this point now. So I think it's going to happen a little differently than what the uh, the scholars all predict or say or the way that the stories are represented to us. But I can see the writing on the wall here. And there's just something that doesn't strike right the human soul with the rise of this whole metaverse idea and all of these different things. The building of digital worlds virtual worlds, virtual realities, the capturing of the human mind by these electronic devices. This is all of that aramonic influence, that antichrist spirit that permeates the macrocosmic level of our reality right now, that is drawing us in to that, drawing us into this artificial digital world where it wants us to reside full time. And when it draws us in there full time, and we go through this process called the transhuman singularity, once that happens, once the very first human being merges with the machine, and this, this transhuman singularity occurs, that will be the arrival in the physical world here of Antichrist. That, I think, is the whole crux of the situation here. And I give kudos to this David B. Black, who wrote this book back in 1981. It's called The Computer and the Incarnation of Aramon, and it expounds upon some of the ideas of Steiner, and it goes into a lot of really nerdy mathematical-type computer programming guy things in here, but <laughs> it's really drawing the lines of intent, and it's drawing the uh, lines back to the Aramonic influence in things. It connects more of the dots, and it really calls out and predicts the rise of the transhumanist movement when you really get down to the nuts and bolts aspect of it all. Way back in 1981, when these things were scarcely being discussed, this guy recognized it because he studied Rudolf Steiner, and he also studied computer science and, you know, did all of these different things for a living. So he recognized right away that this would be the vehicle through which Araman, or the Antichrist, would manifest here first on a macrocosmic level before arriving on the microcosmic level within the body of the human being. And we're on our way to that with all of these technologies, these ever more invasive technologies ever more addictive to the human mind. You see, Steiner said that in 1879, the archangel Michael did battle with Araman in heaven and cast him down to earth to reside in the human head, primarily in the human mind. And what do we see? Well, we're being led down this road of the brain-computer interface and all these things that go with it and all these technologies that are promised to improve the human condition and take us through this transhuman singularity towards post-humanism, which will be the advent of Araman in the physical world here, in the flesh, merged with the machine, man merged with the machine, the advent of Antichrist. So that's where we're at. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting. And I hope you give it consideration and do some study on your own. What do you want? We want information. 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 Who are you? The new number two. Who is number one? 
You are number six. I am not a number. I am a free man. 